Hello and welcome everybody to another episode of Bread Theory. We are continuing on tonight with Alexander Berkman's What is Communist Anarchism, which is also known by the ABC of Anarchism. And tonight he's going to be sharing his views on the Russian Revolution, starting with the, the first part of the revolution, uh, which was the, the fight against the, the Tsar. And um, I, I think the chapter after that is going to be on what is known as the October Revolution. So we're covering the, the, what I believe is known as the February Revolution tonight. We might get into the October Revolution, which was the one that the Soviets eventually won and, and, and created the Soviet Union out of. Um, but yeah, this is kind of the interim period in between the initial revolution and that. And tonight with me is my wife, Amanda. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing okay. Yeah. How are you? Doing pretty well. Thank you for joining me. It's always fun to have your, your opinion on the stuff that we cover. And also, if you like this sort of thing, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, follow, uh, and donate if you're, if you're able to as well. The, the link is right up there in the chat. Just go to the link tree. You can find links to all the different platforms that I'm on, an archive of all my videos, which I keep on YouTube, and uh, links to the, the Patreon. And I, I'm really trying to, to build up the Patreon at this point. Uh, my ultimate goal is to get enough patrons that I can make this a full-time career. Uh, so that would be pretty amazing. But it takes help from uh, viewers like you, to put it in, a, in a PBS terms. Wow. You just did that, guys. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have a mug or anything. All I have is, is thank yous. So... I, could, I could make a mug. I know ceramics. Yes. Sorry, I was an art major. Yeah, so oh, I, yeah, I no, legitimately she's, she's know. the real deal. Um, maybe we can make t-shirts screen. Print. I mean, you know what? That is my next step is I'm going to, I'm going to make a merch store up on my, my stream elements. Uh, I'll have a link to that pretty soon. Cause, uh, uh, my, my, well, I guess not technically my sister-in-law, but you know, basically my sister-in-law Heather not. made some, some great new logos for me. So like, I can probably even put one of the logos up right now. Yeah, so she made this one coming up there in the corner. Uh, really nice looking. And and I will start out by putting that onto to t shirts so you can support in that way as well. Um, Maybe we can come up with some crazy, silly, funny things to put on t shirts. Oh, too. sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the main thing is it all has to be original stuff. I can't be, you know, oh, well. copy pasta. But yeah, at least we have a couple artists within the family. And hopefully a few within the audience as well. So together we can, we oh, can yeah. we put something together. You want to make stuff? Do it. Yeah, yeah sure. definitely. Yeah, if you have stuff that you would like to uh, help out with the designs for for this channel, definitely appreciate that. That, that would be a great way that you can support the show. All right. So let's start sharing this here. I'm full screen that. And make sure the closed captioning is on. And we'll get into it. Systems are go. Oh, so yeah. So so thank you very much to the Patreons who've signed up so far. John T. and Mike E. Really appreciate your support. Uh, and yeah, hope to keep growing. Keep the ball rolling. Keep the, you know, keep the movement moving. The train. Keep the, keep the train on the, on the right track. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you make noises. I'm going to move the camera a little bit so you're more in frame here. No. Yeah. You can't escape. This is like when I zoomed this morning and I was like a fourth of my body was on the Oh, was it? Interview. Yeah, it was impressive. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty even. All right. Now, uh, another thing to, to mention before we get started, this is a learning space. So if you have any questions, no matter how advanced or, or uh, entry level they are, always happy to do my best to, to help you learn more. Um, the only bad question is one that's asked in bad faith. So, yeah. Did you have anything else to add before we get going? Uh, our shirts match. Our shirts are the same color today. Did you plan that? No. Yeah, right. She, she, she's always trying to do this matchy-matchy couples thing. I'm like, come on. That's so played out. Never. <laughs> he keeps this up next time I come on stream. I'm wearing a costume. You can wear a costume. That's totally fine. I, I am, I'm not opposed to self-expression. 
you know. Are you? Yeah, I'm not. As long as it's not against Twitch TOS. <laughs> so, like, you have to have pants to be on stream. Don't start. I, I know that's that's a hard concept for some people, but you know, you know in rules capitalism, is rules. In capitalism, some people can't afford to buy pants. That that's that's true. That let's, that's true. Let's start the story, guys. Okay, let's get into the story. <laughs> this could go on for hours. You don't deserve that. Or maybe you do. We don't punish the learners. It's not punishment. This is banter. This is gold. <laughs> anyway. Let them decide. Let's go. As always, we're using Audible Anarchist. Uh, let me open that in a new tab. Okay. In fact, why don't I just link you to this video? That'll be easiest of all. So, in case you want to come back later on and check it out, here is the video. We'll be using tonight right there. Audible Anarchist, wonderful free resource on YouTube. All sorts of anarchist audiobooks, just for free. So, for people like you. For people like you. Oh, you can do the rest of the stream like Moira. Yeah, you can do the whole thing in Moira's. I was thinking that Alexander Berkman's ideas reminded me of my time in Hello Dolly when I played Dolly. To rave reviews. <laughs> wow. <laughs> See, I could be Moira. All right. You Let's... might be able to be Moira, but really, could you be Moira? Well, certain people are saying so, and I tend to believe what people say. Perhaps we need to fold in the attitude. Hmm, fold perhaps, perhaps. In the attitude. I don't have nearly as many hats to be Moira, so I think she's definitely got me beat there. <laughs> anyway, let's go. I said go. It said no. This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible yeah. Anarchist. Nice. Chapter 15. Between February and October, oh, shares all my places. I remember attending a very large mass meeting in Madison Square Garden, New York, called to celebrate the dethronement of the Tsar. The huge hall was crowded with 20,000 people wrought up to the highest pitch of enthusiasm. Russia is free, the leading speaker began. A veritable hurricane of applause, shouts, and hurrahs greeted the declaration. It continued for many minutes breaking out again and again. But when the audience became quiet and the orator was about to proceed, there came a voice from the crowd, Free for what? There was no reply. The speaker continued his harangue. The Russians are a simple and naive people. Never having had any constitutional rights, they had no interest in politics I gotta, and were not I gotta corrupted stop already. by it. They knew little of Congress and parliaments and First cared less about them. Right. There we go. That's Free better. for what, they wondered. You were... Because they were simple and naive? Yeah, that... again, we're seeing uh, Berkman's kind of condescension towards the common person. I'm not liking that one bit. What do you think about that? That's gross. Yeah, I mean, if you're trying to win over the masses, that's probably not the way to do it, just from at least a practical point of view. Despite, you know, whatever it is you may think in your heart or, or feel... Right, like this calling is... a bunch of people, calling them the masses a bunch of rubes <laughs> who don't know any better. Your naivete is unsettling. Yeah, right. It's like, like that's not cool. There's stuff you know and stuff you don't know yet, and actually, you know what? That gets complicated. I don't think I'm ready for that rabbit hole. Oh, okay. I don't know what rabbit hole you're even referring to. That's okay. I think it's just best if we continue. Okay. Keep keeping on keeping on. You are free from the Tsar and his tyranny, they were told. That was very fine, they thought. But what about the war? The soldier asked. How about the land? The peasant demanded. How about a decent existence? The proletarian urged. You see, my friend, those Russians were so uneducated that they were not satisfied just to be free from something. They wanted to be free for something, free to do what they wanted. And what they wanted was a chance to live, to work, and enjoy the fruits of their labor. 
That is, they wanted access to the land so that they could raise food for themselves, access to the mines, shops, factories, so as to produce what they needed. But under the provisional government, just as under the Romanovs, those things belonged to the wealthy. They remained private property. As I say, the simple Russian knew nothing about politics, but he knew exactly what he wanted. He lost no time in making his wants known and was determined to get them. The soldier and sailors chose their spokesmen from their own midst to present to the provisional government to demand to terminate the war. Their representatives organized themselves as soldiers' councils called Soviets in Russia. The peasants and city workers did the same. In this manner, every branch of the army, navy, every agriculture and industrial district, every factory even, established its own Soviets. And in the course of time, the various Soviets formed the all-Russian Soviet workers, soldiers, and peasants' deputies, which held its sessions in Petrograd. Through the Soviets, the people presently began to voice their demands. The provisional government, the new liberal regime under the leadership of Milyukov, paid no attention. It is characteristic of all political parties alike that once in power, they turned a deaf ear to the needs and wants of the masses. The provisional government was no different in this than the czarist autocracy. It failed to understand the spirit of the time, and it stupidly believed that a few minor reforms would satisfy the country. It kept busy talking and discussing, proposing new bills and enacting more legislation. But it was not laws the people wanted. They wanted peace, while the government insisted on continuing the war. They cried for land and bread, but what they got was more laws. If history teaches anything at all, its clearest lesson is you can't defy or resist the will of a whole people. You can suppress it for a while, stem the tide of popular protest, but the more violently will the storm rage when it comes. Then it will break down every obstacle, sweep away all opposition, and its momentum will carry it even further than its original intention. That has been the story of every great conflict, of every revolution. Recall the American War for Independence, for instance. The rebellion of the colonies against Great Britain began with the refusal to pay the tea tax enacted by the government of George III. The comparatively unimportant objection to taxation without representation, meeting with the king's opposition, resulted in war and ended in completely freeing the American colonies from English rule. Thus was born the Republic oh. of the United States. Yes. Let's talk about taxes. <laughs> okay. Let's hear what you got. Taxation without representation. I think we've talked about this before, but I think it bears repeating. Mm -hmm. So if you have persons under the age of 18 that are working a job, I do not give a flip if it is babysitting, if it is working, flipping burgers or a lifeguard at the local pool, whatever. Should those people not be allowed to vote? Because they are being taxed. Right. And, and yeah, they get no representation in, in that they don't get to vote. And I mean, really, let, let's even look at the how things are set up right after the American Revolution. Uh, who got representation after that point? It definitely wasn't everybody. Nope. It was white men. White men. And only white men that owned land. So this was a very, very much a, a, a bourgeois revolution. And it is, it is no coincidence that we live now in a, a bourgeois democracy where we technically may have the right to choose our representatives. We technically may have the right to run as representatives, but basically influence and ability to run are only possible for you know, at least the petty bourgeois class. You have to at least own a business or, or be wealthy uh, in order to, to have the time and money to take off work and run a campaign. Mm -hmm. 
and you have to have a lot of money in order to hire a lobbyist or to really organize anything uh, to influence government. And uh, you have to be at the head of an industry to, to come in and be a, a consultant to the various uh, committees that, that the government sets up. So yeah, it's, it is, it is supposedly a, a government of the people and by the people, but the bulk of the, of the people are just kind of tagging along and participating where they can. But I mean, it's little wonder that, you know, uh, things like, uh, the, the Democrats or the DNC's favorite candidate tends to be the one that, that wins the primary, regardless of, of public sentiment. They will pull any lever, pull any strings they can. It's what happened last time uh, again with with Bernie, where he was he was crushing it. He was ahead of, of of everybody for the first several races until it came up to Super Tuesday, and then just before that point, uh, there was a couple things that happened. One was that that James Clyburn uh, endorsed Biden, and that was you know. A very establishment dem Democrat um, throwing his weight in the race that way. So that had huge influence. Uh, and then also Obama uh, pressured all of the, the various other moderates that were splitting up the, the moderate vote. He pressured them into to dropping out in, in return for getting uh, seats on, on, like in the cabinet. Uh, for some of them, like like Buttigieg, that's how he got his seat uh, on the transportation as transportation secretary. Um, so yeah, I mean, the DNC didn't care what the people really wanted. They they cared that their preferred person got the nomination. So particularly at the federal level, it is it is a bourgeois game. Uh, at the local level, things can be more up for debate. Uh, there is a lot more power locally because, for one thing, you know, to have any influence on, on Washington, D.C., you likely have to be able to travel out there on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And that's totally out of the reach of, of the average person. But you might be able, if you live in a, in a big city that's, that's um, either close to the capital or, or the capital itself, you might be able to, to sometimes... Um, stop by for, for a rally at least or something like that. And then also the, the, the races tend to be a lot lower stakes and there tends to be, even in large cities, um, certain governmental positions that, that remain open that are, are supposed to be for like citizens advisory boards for things like, uh, you know, uh, the, the citizen zoning board or the parks advisory board, these sorts of things oftentimes will have seats open. And you basically just have to to have any extra time to run for it. Still, still going to be shut out uh, if you're in the in the working class, or I shouldn't even say working class. If you're just a poorer person in general, uh, you just got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah, there's a reason that started out as a joke. <laughs> it's because it is an impossible task. So yeah. All right, let's move on. But uh, clearly so far, Berkman is, is not impressed with the, the original reformist attempts to turn uh, a monarchy into to more, it, it sounds like. And I, I'm not real versed on, on this part of history, but it sounds like the original attempts were just more reforms to uh, institute more of a, a, a you know, common, what we would call a liberal democracy or would be more aptly named a bourgeois democracy uh, in place of the, the old Zara system. So he's not too impressed with that, it sounds Eight. like. The French Revolution similarly began with a demand for small improvements and reforms. The refusal of Louis XVI to lend ear to the popular voice cost him not only his throne, but also his head, and brought about the destruction of the entire feudal system in France. Just so did Tsar Nicholas II. Welcome to the stream, Kay. How do you say? Uh, so, what part made you mad? 
so mad. Oh, you're, you're probably referring to uh, how they did Bernie dirty twice, twice in a row. Uh, yeah, that definitely made me mad as well. So anyway, welcome in. Haters gotta hate. Well, I mean, it goes beyond just hating, though. It's 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 manipulation. It's uh, playing favorites when, mm -hmm. you know, we're supposed to live under a democracy. And yet they, they only barely make the pretense of it when, when it comes to selecting who the representatives are, at least on, on the national level. It's a joke. I mean, I, I don't know how long ago it was, but it was fairly recent history that they... Uh, even let the primaries be open to the public. There was there was a long time in, in all parties' histories where primaries were just closed and it was just, you know, decided on amongst the, the, the people that contributed to the party in one way or another. So even that part is is fairly new history. Yeah, how the DNC forced Bernie out, that was absolutely ridiculous. I don't think Biden had won in a, a single contest or even come into the, the the top two until somehow super tuesday when all these strings got pulled mm -hmm. and uh all this this weight was thrown behind biden it's... and uh, it, it makes it even the more frustrating considering how biden then ran his campaign which was hardly anything at all he barely said anything barely made any speeches barely showed up to any events or anything he just kind of was behind the scenes people were wondering if he had he had died at, at certain points um, thanks for the follow, the, the burn tower. Uh, so it was, it was a nothing campaign. He barely even had any promises that he had put forth at that point, which, which should go to show you that if, if a stuffed suit can beat, uh, Trump, then Bernie certainly could have, because Bernie actually had substance and ideas that energized people and brought them out. I think people are just so beyond like too far removed from kindergarten that the idea of caring about other people it's too much to process yeah absolutely true it sounds really stupid but i feel that way no like, no there, there's certain people that just don't mature we past don't that like point wars. we yeah. don't like people that aren't white like yeah, there's a lot of complainers. Things. Anyone that complains about the system, you know, gets gets complained about themselves. Uh -huh. uh, talked about as entitled millennials or, or Karens, you know. but I mean that, that's a different thing. I think Karens. I mean, it's it's certainly a product of the sort of entitlement that that looks mm -hmm. down their nose at absolutely everybody, right? Uh, who doesn't have things as good as them, and and people that have no idea, have no self awareness of of why. It is, uh, you know, um, as good for them as it is. I mean, what? Oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, what a bodacious idea to have, like, people have housing, people have food, yeah, people right. get health care. I mean, I really don't think it's going to be a problem for me to wait an extra 10 minutes in a waiting room if... If the truth really is yeah. that the wait times could be longer. Yeah, which uh, like, the, the data on that's pretty shaky at best, whether well, it really is right longer. And also, like, I mean, come on, when you go to the doctor's office now, they're like 15 minutes. And ideally, they want you in and out faster than that. What's wrong? Like, you don't get right. time to sit down and talk to them. And the doctor certainly isn't sitting and, like, hanging on every word you say. And that's a good, that's a good point, too, that, that wait time is not the only metric we should be looking at here. It should be quality of care, not just how often you get it. Right. It's just like, what's wrong? Da, da, da. Let's get in and out. Mm -hmm. Like, I was like, oh, but this is really sure. bad. Oh, you, you came to me to see this me about this one thing sure. so that's all, all i want to talk to you about yeah i mean conservatives will bang on about how oh we have uh, world-class healthcare. people from canada come here to get treatments and stuff like that and it's like well <laughs> sure which canadians yeah which canadians i mean definitely they probably wouldn't be able to name any of them but beyond that uh no we do have like, what we do wealth have... class what oh what class Are of these canadians? Yeah. canadians with a ton of money and nothing right <laughs> not a lot of yeah, those those can it is the wealthy. Yeah, right. So for the wealthy, sure, we have world class healthcare. You know, the sky's the limit, especially when it comes to you know, 
uh, intricate procedures of, of dealing with cancer and, and, and stuff like that. Yeah, we have world-class health care if you can afford it. And the average person can't. Mm -hmm. Like, I have to fight to get my refills. If I don't have, like, several labs set up, they'll be like, no, you can't have this med. You need it to live, but you can't have it until well, geez, you come I mean, in. And insurance is 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 such a, a scam industry in the first place. It's it's the only uh, service provider that I'm aware of where they can charge you month after month after month for having it, and then also every time you use it. Mm -hmm. How does that make any sense? What's the point of the insurance if I have to to pay for it just to use it as well? Like, and don't even get me started on this. Who's in network and out of network. Sorry, if my arm's cut off, I'm going to the first fucking place I can get to. Well, oh, yeah. That, I'm not going to call them. Right. Hey, I just had my arm sawed off, but I was wondering which hospitals were in network so I can make sure I get brought to the right place. Right. Yeah. The ambulance doesn't give a shit. It's go. Anyway, we, we, we've no, gone this, far this afield from, from our original point of uh, <laughs> talking about the, the <laughs> Russian Revolution. But yeah. Uh, Bourgeois democracy is not not so great for the average person, and I think uh, Berkman is is finding the same thing in his own experience. Believe that a few insignificant concessions would stop the revolution. He also paid for his stupidity with his crown and life. The same fate overtook the provisional government. That is why a wise man said that history repeats itself. It always does with government. History doesn't repeat itself, people do. The provisional do. government hmm. consisted mostly of conservative men who did not understand the people and were far removed from their needs. The masses demanded peace after all. The provisional government, under the leadership of Milyukov and the later under Kerensky, was determined to continue the war, even in the face of general dissatisfaction and the serious breakdown of the industrial and economic life of the country. The rising waves of revolution were soon to sweep it away. The Soviet of workers and soldiers' deputies was preparing to take matters into its own hands. Meanwhile, the people did not wait. The soldiers at the front had already themselves decided to quit the war as unnecessary and useless slaughter. By the hundreds of thousands, they were leaving the fields of battle and returning home to their farms and factories. They began carrying into effect the real objects of the revolution. For them, the revolution did not mean printed constitutions and paper rights, but the land and the workshop. Between June and October... Right, this is, this is what uh, Peter Kropotkin talks so much about in, in The Conquest of Bread. Now, the revolution is not just signing of documents or even overturning the, the current power order in favor of a new one or, or any of the, the, the setup of bureaucracy or any of these other things. The, the, the revolution is fulfilling the promises of getting past, you know, the, the exploitative system that you're under, whether that's a monarchy or whether that's a, a capitalist system. It's doing away with, with exploitation and providing the needs for people. To, for them to live their lives and actually have freedom and, and choice in their life. Anything else? No, I'm still thinking about health still, care. Oh. Okay. 1917, while the provisional what? government kept on endlessly discussing reforms, the peasants started confiscating the estates of large landholders and the workers took possession of the industries. This was called expropriating the capitalist class. That is, depriving the masters of the things they had no right to monopolize, the things they had appropriated from the laboring classes, from the people. In this manner, the soil was expro expropriated from the landlords, the mines and the mills from their owners, the warehouses from the speculators, the workers and farmers took everything in charge through their labor unions, and agrarian organizations. The liberal government of Milyukov had insisted on keeping up the war because the Allies wanted it. The revolutionary government of Kerensky also remained deaf to the popular demands. It passed drastic laws against unauthorized taking of land by the peasantry. 
Kerensky did everything in his power to keep the army at the front and even reintroduced the death penalty for desertion. <laughs> but now, people ignored the government. So look at that. You, you have actual real reforms in your country. Actually, people seizing power and, and finally getting a piece of what is, is, is due to them, a piece that's been stolen from them their entire lives. And, and what happens? This, this, this bourgeois interim government passes all sorts of laws against it and cracks down on it and, and punishes deserters. So you, you don't have the freedom to leave the army at that point. Um, I, I mean, it just shows where the, the interests and where the loyalties lie in, in these sorts of, of government institutions. It is, it is to the, the old aristocracy. It is to the, the already rich and powerful and, and those that, that already own. Mm -hmm. you, still, you still wound up about yep. healthcare. Right. All right. Why don't, why don't you say some more about healthcare? Let's no. Go. Okay. You don't want to just get it out so we can. It just makes me really mad. What, what makes you really? Just healthcare in general? Healthcare in general. Yeah. And like. An incredibly unfair system in this country. Can I also just say if healthcare were free, people would not have to make job decisions based on whether or not they get it. Ah, yeah. See, see in, a, in a bourgeois democracy, that's a feature, not a bug. You know, that, that, that's a way to, to keep control over you and to keep make, make people think twice about leaving their job and make them accept worse and worse conditions as long as they still get their free, is, you know, their employee provided healthcare that they still pay a mm -hmm. large chunk of. But yeah, I mean, I mean that that literally is the way that that some of these these neoliberal Democrats argue about it. There was there was some town hall meeting and I, that uh, there was some video that I, I watched recently that they brought this up, uh, where where they were in a place where um, basically the entire town worked for the the healthcare industry, the insurance industry. Um, Sounds like Woodbury, not really insurance, but 3M. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's definitely that sort of thing. And Pete Buttigieg was like, "Can you look all these people in the face?" And he was talking to Bernie at the time. Mm -hmm. He's like, "Can you look all these people in the face and say that they don't deserve to have a job anymore?" Because universal health care destroys the entire health insurance industry, and it, and it would. A lot of people would, would be out of work if if we had universal health care. Do you that, think that, anyone that, works in insurance actually likes working in insurance? Because half of the phone calls they right. get, they're getting chewed out. You know how I know this? I used to work in insurance. Sorry. Yeah. No, no. But but even beyond that point, uh, that's good. We should be getting rid of worthless jobs <laughs> that don't contribute a damn thing to to society in any positive manner. And, and if giving people uh, uh, access to, to health insurance across the board means the destruction of, of, of bullshit jobs, so be it. Um, and that's just, you know, it's unfortunate for certain cities that, that get themselves too much entangled in, in uh, one industry or another. It's, it's like, um, it would be like, you know, with, uh, what's the city that, that Hormel is in, in I Minnesota? Don't know. It's some Minnesota town where, like, the only industry is is working for Hormel. It's called. It's nicknamed like Spamville. I don't remember which one it is, but it's it's a very small town, and it would be like you know. Uh, um, Falcon you know, Heights. Any any sort of campaign to to eat more healthy or to go vegan or anything like that would be a direct threat to to that entire town's livelihood, and and that's the truth. But shouldn't we be looking for the greater good, not just the the you know keeping this system and that system in place, just because it happens to employ people? That seems like a really terrible idea to hold an entire country back, or you know, even an entire city back. Um, and it's just it's really unfortunate when these these these. Uh, places get uh, entangled that way. So we have a question from the Burn Tower. What or how is communist anarchism different than ANCAP? It is diametrically opposed, I would say. 
They are complete polar opposites. So, though they both call themselves anarchists, really what, what anarcho-capitalism is, is capitalism without regulation, or there's little regulation as possible. I mean, I think even the most diehard and caps would have to agree that things like contract law still have to be in place, and you still have to have a police force. Um, I suppose they might want a, a private security force instead. But uh, anarcho-communism is about the most good for the most people, the most freedom, democracy, choice, bodily autonomy for the most people. Anarcho-capitalism is about the most freedom and, and, and choice and uh, agency for the few owners, for people that already have for five people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For 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 people that that are are owners already, that own land, that own businesses, um, it's freedom for them, and and true, uh, to to institute a, a system of of anarcho communism, would mean less freedom for people to exploit one another. But overall, it can be it can be said that that's better overall. There's more freedom for more people. So sure, you can't just treat your employees like garbage. You can't cut safety regulations. You can't just dump in the river all of your chemicals and stuff like that. So those are freedoms that you would lose. Um, ANCAPs are basically classical liberals. I mean, that term classical liberalism has been thrown around so much lately uh, to hide what people actually believe that it's, it's hard to even tell at this point. Um, and libertarians, there's another term that's been stolen from the left, like deliberately, Murray Rothbard, one of the most famous uh, ANCAPs, deliberately stole the term libertarian and, and tried to apply it to the right. To the rest of the world, libertarian means left wing. It means, you know, anarcho-communist, basically, or, or, or uh, socialist libertarian. That's another way of, of putting it, or libertarian socialist, I should say. Um, so, so yeah, but the way it's understood in the U.S. and the U.S. alone, uh, yeah, libertarianism. So they, they care about their own personal freedom, even if it means the expense of other people's freedom. Anarcho-communism cares about personal freedom up until the point that it starts infringing on other people's freedom, right? So if, if rights are balanced, if, if, say, my right to swing my arms ends at the tip of your nose, then our rights are in balance. Um, if, if my right to make a health decision about myself by, by smoking affects the, the health of the people around me, then that's where my right ends, unless they somehow consent to it. Um, I don't consent. No, 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 I wouldn't either. I, I wouldn't want to be in a, a, a smoky bar. and I certainly wouldn't want to be forced to work in a smoky bar or, or a place like that. So even though it is it is curtailing the freedoms of, of smokers, it is for a balance of rights and more freedom overall to be free from the effects of, of secondhand smoke. Uh, so those are, those are the basic differences that I would say. Does, does that help uh, answer your question at all? All right, while you're thinking about that, we'll move on in the chapter. The situation again proved that the real power of a country lies in the hands of the masses, of those who fight, toil, and produce, and not in any parliament or government. Kerensky, at one time, was the adored idol of Russia, more powerful than any czar. Yet his authority was lost, his government fell, and he himself had to flee for his life when the people realized that he was not serving their cause. While he was still head of the provisional government, the actual power began to go over to the Petrograd Soviet, most of whom member, whose members were revolutionary workers, peasants, and soldiers. So isn't that basically just socialism? Ah, well, there's, there's a great video, and I will, I will look it up uh, as soon as I, I put it back. Um, but socialism is, is more or less an umbrella term. It, 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 it more or less refers to all of the left side of, of the political spectrum, all the ideas there. So it includes communism, it includes anarchism, uh, and it includes things that are somewhere in between, like, uh, or, or somewhat 
you know, closer to, to capitalism, like market socialism. It includes all that sort of thing. It's basically anything left of capitalism could be called socialism. And it, it starts with the premise that um, all people are more or less equal. Uh, and not, not just men, we're not, we're not doing the, the United States uh, Declaration of Independence, uh, but all people are more or less equal. And it doesn't matter your class, your race, your, your economic background, any of that stuff. The, the talents, the abilities, the, the worthwhileness of any person is, is more or less equal across all of the arbitrary ways of dividing humanity. Um, and so it then says that because of that, they're more or less do equal amounts of, of rights. And to have equal rights, you have to have more or less equal standing to start from. You have to have a platform that is, that is equal to your neighbors you know, otherwise you're not, you're starting from an unequal place. Um, so yeah, socialism would be a, a fair way of characterizing all of this stuff. Um, so the, the dictatorship of the proletariat is particular to communism. And it's the idea that, that after a, after the current order has been toppled, after capitalism has been uh, done away with, that the, the vanguard party, this is usually how it's, it's conceived of, uh, goes about setting up the dictatorship of the proletariat. And, and the proletariat means all the workers. So it is, it is supposed to give control over to the workers themselves. There's many different forms that that can take. Uh, there could be Soviets that, that, that emerge, and a Soviet is, is basically the collective will of a particular industry um, or, or, or you know, a particular business, I should say. Um, and they get together to, you know, fairly distribute things and to, to, uh, enact the will of the people, basically. So how do you ensure equality with limited resources such as land? Everyone can't live in the good spots on the coast, for example. Well, sure, uh, that, that's true. Um, but you can at least give everyone some place to live that they don't have to spend a third of their income uh, towards for their entire life trying to, to either rent or, or buy off. Um, you can give people a place to live. Uh, I also don't think every single person would want to live by the water. I feel like sure. things would kind of balance themselves out to some extent. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm happy living here for now. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're in Minnesota. So uh, the only water that we're around is the Mississippi, really. Um, and I'm, I'm certainly happy to live here. I, I, I would be happy having uh, basically our sized apartment that we have now, plus an extra couple of bedrooms uh, for when my kids come over. That would be great. That, that would be all I need, really. And, and for most people, you don't have to have like a mansion or, or some super swanky apartment, just a place where the utilities work, uh, that's in good repair, and uh, that is that is physically secured. And, and that's about all they need. And, and maybe close to, you know, goods and services that they need, you know, or their job or whatever. Yeah, I was going to say, or at least have access to, to, to my job is probably transportation. Sure. The most important thing in my head. And like I said, I personally would prefer to live in a place where there's four seasons four distinct seasons yeah and and when, and when we say equality it's not like absolute equality where everyone lives in exactly the same manner and everyone has exactly the same job and everyone is compensated exactly the same amount or has the same exact responsibility at their work it's enough you know it's the basics at least so a, a, a um, safe and secure housing with modern utilities. It is adequate, nutritious food to, you know, not just baseline survive, but, you know, thrive, have good nutrition. It is access to safe, reliable, and affordable or free transportation. And that could come in the form of mass transit. That's, that's ac an acceptable way to, to provide transportation to the masses. Um, it is access to whatever education one desires. 
uh, free of charge, um, because that is a huge barrier to a lot of people for getting the education that they would otherwise want. Not everyone wants to go to college and not everyone should have to go to college, but you still should be able to survive no matter what your job is. Because every job is, is necessary at some point. Every job is, is providing something to your community. And there should be equity ideally. within the public schools as well. Mm -hmm. Like even now, there's still a really big problem with like gerrymandering. Oh, school districts, yeah. Even now, which is sad, like everyone should get a fair shot. And then sure. also I'm going to backpedal because it just popped into my head and that's where I'm at right now. Um, like we talk, I, I work in education. I'm a behavior specialist and we talk a lot about like making sure the kids baseline needs are met at mm -hmm. least when they're at school. Right. Yeah. So like, have they been fed? Are they okay? Are they in the green zone? Right. So like green is like good, happy, like. I have a question. But that's okay. But we'll get to that after after you finish your thought there. So, if the kid comes in and they're not green, how do we get them to green? Oh, I'm hungry. Okay, let's go get them some food. So, so green zone is contented, right? It's like right. I am. I am Base, my baseline needs are met. I am okay. So, so I'm, I'm safe. I am not hungry. So I'm, I'm ready to learn and I'm ready to learn. Stuff I'm ready to go. And not beat the hell out of my classmates. <laughs> For now. I, ideally. <laughs> right. I'm not going to punch anyone in the face till closer lunch. So, right. like, but I mean, I still feel like that applies even to adults, not just kids, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if you have a mental issue, if you have a problem and your baseline needs are not getting met, that problem is far worse for you than if you had reliable shelter, food, access to transit, etc. Uh-huh. Because, like, when the baseline needs are met, then the real work can get done. Uh, that's okay. I'm always happy to, to answer these sorts of questions. It's, it's totally fine. And, the, and this chapter, uh, to be honest, is, is probably a lot less important than some of the other stuff we've covered. This is basically just his account of the way one particular revolution went. Uh, it's not as much him laying out his ideas or anything like this. This is just uh, laying groundwork for him to... to expound his ideas on later on. So it's, that, that's totally fine. Don't worry about that at all. So is there a concern about individuals losing direct access to the means of production if they're owned by the masses? So that's only one way to do it. Uh, it socialism is, is, is the workers owning the means of production. That could be collectively as a community. That's not the way that I would favor, but that, that definitely is one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is just saying that if if you are going to be part of a, a business, you're going to have uh, rights as though you're on, say, the, the, the board of that business, the same rights that they would have. So you'd be able to vote about um, things like uh, workplace safety, about who gets compensated what. And again, there's nothing saying that you can't say, well, this position is really important and the, and the person who's in it has done really hard work, we'd like to compensate them more uh, okay. in, in, in comparison to everyone else. But you still get a say, that's the important part. Uh, it's democratizing the workplace as much as possible. And again, that doesn't mean that everyone does every job necessarily. You can still have bosses. You can still have people that have their job because of specialized skills that they have or specialized knowledge that they have. Sure, someone that's might okay. be really good at overseeing things. Someone might have been able to do most of the jobs like the smaller jobs like they have skills across the thing so they're best equipped to know how all these inner pieces should work together or most effective sure and, and that and that's totally fine that's a totally that that is a justified hierarchy we talk in anarchism a lot about how no uh, uh no hierarchy is inherently justified you have to make a case for it at the very least of why it needs to be in place. Expertise can be that, that, that justification. That certainly can be. So in this sort of a workplace, which is, which is often referred to as like a, a worker owned and directed cooperative, you just have a say in the way things are done. 
uh, you have a say in the in how profits are divvied up. Instead of one person at the top getting to make all of these decisions about how work is going to take place, what the hours are, what the scheduling is, what benefits are going to be offered, uh, what compensation levels are going to be offered, uh, what the hiring and firing process is, who can be hired and fired, on and on and on. And having it basically a private dictatorship, which is the way that, that a capitalist business is set up, we're adding democracy to it so that everyone gets an equal say on these very important things. But again, like, like taking that specialized knowledge, it's not as though if you worked for a, a worker-owned cooperative that's a nuclear power plant, that the janitor would have a democratic say over what level to run the reactors at. That would be a decision that would be left up to people that have expertise about that particular specialized part of the field. Mm -hmm. But they would have say over what their compensation is, what their hours are, what sick leave or maternity leave or paternity leave might look like. All these sorts of things that are very important uh, when, it, when it comes to how you spend most of your waking hours, he would have a say on the same as everyone else. Mm -hmm. Does that make a little more sense? So if everything is based on voting, what stops political parties from taking over across industries? Even if they are banned, they can still meet underground. Well, I mean, I guess there's, there's nothing inherently stopping any system from being taken down. There's no system that is inevitable, that is, that is the end-all, be-all. And that is something that, that, that various leftist ideologies uh, talk about and debate about uh, quite often. That was one of the failings of the, of the Paris Commune, according to pretty much everyone that was a part of it, was that they did not prepare enough for being invaded from without. So you still might have enemies from without and from within. You might have former, you know, employers that are used to being the big boss who uh, managed to round up enough people to, to try and take things over again. There's nothing saying that that can't happen, of course. Um, so in the case of, of like the, say that this revolution that we're talking about, their solution was to actively repress them, uh, to fight them, to forcibly remove them from their property. If that was the case, um, in the case of, of say an anarchist revolution, it wouldn't necessarily be done the same way, but the idea would be to invest enough people with the benefits of the revolution that collectively people would decide to act against bad actors. You, no matter your system, you have to, to deal with bad actors. There's always going to be people that flout the rules, that try to dominate others, that, that, that just don't have enough empathy or care for their fellow man to, you know, not harm them at every, every time it's convenient. Mm -hmm. So you, have to fear, you, have to, you do have to figure out how to deal with that, uh, no matter what your system is. So what, what, what most socialist schools of thought are going to tell you, though, is that when things are more equal in, in terms of, of the amount of power and, and resources that the average person has, when they're more equal than they are today, not necessarily completely equalized out, but when everyone at least has the basics for their life and a, a meaningful say in their employment, then most of the reasons for, say, criminality just dissolve. Why do you need to, to, to steal things if you are provided with a house and food and you know clothing and your all the basic necessities? Yeah. If your baseline is met, why do you have any reason to steal anymore? Because some people some people still will. Right? There's always gonna be But that's more like for the psychopaths. thrill of it. Yeah, but that that's more for the thrill of it and for, from a severe lack of, of care for your fellow man. Uh, or from from being uh, having that care, uh, you know, abused out of them in one way or another. But that's that's going to always that that's going to be the exception, not the rule. When when everyone is is basically provided for, most of the crime you see today are, are crimes of necessity. I, I mean, that's it. You see people boosting, you know, expensive stereos or uh, or uh, high priced clothing, you know, snatching handbags, all that sort of thing. It's not because they even want that stuff themselves, right? You don't, yeah. <laughs> you don't see a guy wearing like 50 polo shirts or something like that, or, or, or you know, a woman walking around with, with 100 uh, Louis Vuitton bags. 
<laughs> I mean, you might, but I, 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 I have never it's seen that sort of thing. Person's like the, the, what they're doing right. with that is they're turning that into money, right? That they can then use to buy the necessities. Well, we're just cutting out the middleman there. We're cutting out the necessity to, to harm other people in order to get what you need. Like, um, when people steal for thrills, they take weird things like a bra or a pack of batteries at the cash register. Even though they're buying other stuff, they just want to see if they can get away with it. It's not things that are like food, clothing. Yeah. And that, that stuff that tends to be more sporadic too. It's not like the you know the the hardened life of crime types that are, that are doing that sort of thing. Right. Uh, that's that's more for the thrill of it, right? Um, so you, you you asked. It sounds like every business would have a different democratic setup. True. Every every structure would be slightly different. Like maybe um, somebody does like ranked choice voting on things. Sure. Yeah. The way they the way they arrive at their decisions may be different internally. Uh, the, the idea, though, is that everyone should have an equal say on these important facets of, of, of any business. Um, so why is that not done now? Well, it is done now. There are worker-owned cooperatives now. And in fact, they, they have a lower failure rate in the first, I think it's two to five years, than your average, you know, top-down organized um, endeavor. And one reason is because people have more buy-in, you know? If everyone has a say and everyone is getting compensated fairly, you have a lot more reason to try your hardest. You're, also, you're not just there to collect a paycheck. You're there to right, better the, yourself. The person who's doing the better people. Sorry. Yeah, go. That, that is, that is I was it. just going to say the people that are doing the brunt of the work, right? Mm -hmm. Like the people on the front lines have a probably have a better idea about the product, how to move it where to market it to, or like who or where to market it towards. That's a good point too, yeah. Then the person at the top. The person at the top thinks they know. <laughs> right, like like how many, And you maybe know. they do to an extent, but like really. And I, I would say that anyone who's had a number of jobs where they are not the boss uh, can tell you that, that mm -hmm. they, they would, they, I'm sure everyone has had at least one experience where their boss doesn't know a damn thing. And basically all the employers are running things anyway. They'll, they'll make a decision and all the employees will be like, oh, yeah, sure, boss. And then they'll just do the right thing anyway. Yeah. Um, and and also they have a much better idea, like you said, of of how to improve the business because they're on the front lines. Mm -hmm. And I would think about it, too. If you work in, say, a cafe and literally every croissant that, that you sell puts more money in your pocket, that's a huge incentive to want the business to succeed um to to go out of your way to tell friends and family about it to to do a whole bunch of legwork for that business because it has a material impact on on your bottom line as well mm -hmm. so there's a lot more buy-in and like for me so i used to work for the caribou coffee chain and i used to do the supply order and i would try to keep track of when the like buy one get one free days were coming because we would always run out of two types of chocolate. So I'd always double my chocolate order on the week that I knew that stuff was coming, even though my boss would always be like, no, 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 no. She'd change it. But then I'd be in the next morning and I would put the order back to the way that I had it and then submit it. Yeah. So right. she couldn't screw it up. But I mean, every right. time they were like, thank you. My coworkers and employees were like, thank you for doing that. Cause now we were the store that wasn't out. Right. Well, I mean, and how often are things like nepotism a factor mm -hmm. in who gets hired and right. who gets advanced? I'm sure we've all worked at places where, like like right now, my, my current job, uh, my boss is, or my, my manager, I should say, is the owner's son, mm -hmm. right? Uh, he, he's, he's decent at his job, mm -hmm. I will say. It, it happens to be that case, but it could easily go the other way. Like my last job? <laughs> Absolutely. There was tons of nepotism at your last job. And people got promoted that shouldn't have been just because of who they knew. We're related to by blood or marriage. Uh -huh. That was how we made uh -huh. hiring and promotional decisions. Right. And that was really gross. <laughs> right. So, so getting to the question of why every business doesn't do that right now. Uh, I mean, the biggest reason is you make a lot more money just being an owner, right? 
you as an owner uh, say uh, we'll just we'll just make an example of it say you are the owner uh, i always like a cafe as an example i don't know why maybe because i want to own a cafe someday or, or be a a a, a, uh, a uh, founding member of a, a uh, cooperative cafe but anyway uh let's just take a cafe ah ali osher thank you so much for the raid welcome in raiders uh this this is bread theory um and tonight we are talking about Alexander Berkman's What is Communist Anarchism? We're going through the audiobook, and we're pausing right now to answer some, some viewer questions about, about leftism in general, really, but, but how a, a socialist... Hello, Susie. Good to see you. Thanks for coming in. Um, we're talking about how a socialist system might look, okay? And right now we're talking about worker-owned and managed cooperatives. And one of the questions was, if this is so great, why is it not done everywhere? And the answer is the because top's scared. what the top scared. Well, I mean that too, but because you make a lot more profit as an individual owner, it, you know, uh, so, so taking the example of, of you're the owner of a cafe, let's say you you, you buy, um, a Starbucks franchise. We'll just go with that. You don't have to come into work ever and you would still get paid. Uh, thank you, Susie, for your bits. Thank you so much. Radical Maniac, good to see you. Thanks for coming in. We are, we are talking about uh, what, com what is communist anarchism. And right now we're going over worker-owned cooperatives because there were some questions in chat. Um, so anyway, if you are just the owner of a Starbucks franchise, no matter how much you work, you still decide how the, the profits are divvied up. And, and, and to be clear, profits are what you have after you've paid your employees. So employee compensation is looked at as an expense in your typical capitalist enterprise. So after that point, you have profits left over and you get to decide where that goes. You could give bonuses, you could pocket it all yourself. You could put it away for a rainy day. There's, there's any number of things that you can do. Um, so there's a huge incentive in our current system, if you have the means to do it, to just be an owner. And, you know, maybe you work too, maybe you work really hard, but you're still being compensated above and beyond what your work brings into the business, right? Because you have, th th that's the reason to have employees under capitalism is because the expense of, of their compensation is less than the money that they bring into the company. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the whole scheme wouldn't work out. Right. But it's a great scheme if you're at the top, if you're the one who decides where the money goes. Mm -hmm. Otherwise... You know, it's it's not as good of a scheme. And and so there's that incentive. And then there's also the idea that you have absolute control over your business. You know, one of your baristas in, the, in this Starbucks says that um, they would like to offer a new sort of drink. Let's just let's just say that even even something as simple as that. You can just say, no, nah. no, we're not going to do that. Uh, one of your, your employees wants to have Friday off. No or yes, depending on how you feel and your whim. So you have ultimate control but over like, the running of the business. Let's be real. If somebody asks for Friday off and you tell them no, odds are real high they're gonna call in well, sick. <laughs> that's beside the point. <laughs> that's not even what we're talking about, but. Hey. Um, yeah. People have needs, mental health needs, physical needs. People need breaks. We don't favor that in this country. Yeah, right. No, no, <laughs> we work all the time. Right. You will get maybe two weeks of pto if you are lucky if which lucky. you are to use for every reason you could need to be out right so so by the end of the year that's been chipped away because you know life comes up uh thank you scrub lord 1963 it seems like you sub like almost every week <laughs> but, but, but thanks for following again i do appreciate it um so that's the reason there's a huge incentive to keep the current capitalist model if you're a capital owner and if you're anyone else, there's a huge incentive to do away with it. Uh, so Sir Yogi Wan says, Australia has a supermarket chain that is called Independent Growers Association. They support local farmers and companies that produce food products. That sounds really cool. Um, I'm curious how they're actually structured, though, because that's more what we're trying to get at. It's, it's not as much what the business is, because that's something that, that basically all leftists have to reckon with, is that even if you have... A, a fair and equitable system within your company, that doesn't mean your company's doing a good thing for the world. I mean, you could have a, a democratically controlled and operated coal mine, 
<laughs> and and you could still democratically decide to put that, that those tailings into whatever water you can get away with mm -hmm. you know just because part of your business is is right it doesn't mean that all of it is and so that's something that all 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 of socialism we'll just, we'll just use socialism as the umbrella leftist term all of socialism has to grapple with mm -hmm. um that there's another component beyond even the social justice part of it and that's thinking about justice for the earth and thinking about our long-term survival as a, a species that is capable of, of continuing to exist. So anyway, um, that sounds like a cool chain anyway. And uh, always more employee buy-in is, is a good thing. Um, and, and supporting small businesses in general is a good thing, but there's nothing inherently great or good about an, a small business. Uh, they could be really cruel people as well and, and lord it over their employees just because of their size doesn't, doesn't mean they're somehow altruistic, you know? Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think that should answer the questions that you had so far, the, the chatter who was, who was asking about these things. Let's get back into the book and see where this takes us. So, so to, to catch everyone up to speed, Berkman is talking about his experience uh, with the Refer Russian Revolution. So we've had the February Revolution already, and there's a bunch of kind of bourgeois reforms that are going into place. At the same time, a lot of other people are, are making real reforms. They're seizing land, they're seizing the means of production, and the, the, the interim bourgeois government is putting in laws to stop them. Um, so they're, they're being a throttle to progress and in, in generally ineffective otherwise. So let, let's continue on. Various and even opposing views were represented in the Soviet, as is inevitable in bodies composed of different classes of population with their particular interests. But the greatest influence under such circumstances is always exerted by those who voice the deepest feelings and needs of the people. Therefore, the more revolutionary elements of the Soviet gradually gained the mastery for they express the true wants and aspirations of the masses. There were those in the Soviet who held that a constitution, something like that of the United States, was all that Russia needed to obtain freedom and well-being. They asserted that capitalism was all right. There must be masters and servants. So, so, so no wonder they were, were uh, thinking that what the U.S. had done was, was, was pretty good by their uh, standards. They were looking for the same sort of a state, a bourgeois state, where capitalism is is left to, to its own devices, more or less, and capital owners are what everything uh, uh, gives deference to, what the laws give deference to, uh, what what um, political actions give deference to. So yeah, the, these are the, the the same sort of reformists that. Um, <laughs> that that carried out the American Revolution. They wanted uh, a lot of good stuff. That they, they didn't like monarchy, certainly. Wanted more freedom than, than you would have under a monarchy, but didn't want to go so far as, as to give average everyday workers rights and um, means of production. Rich and poor. The people should be satisfied with the rights and liberties which a democratic government could grant them. These were the constitutional democrats called cadets in Russia. They quickly lost their influence because the naive Russian workers and peasants knew that it was not rights and liberties on paper that they wanted, but a chance to work and enjoy the fruits of their labor. They pointed to America with its constitution and dex That sentence doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. He's calling the peasantry naive, but saying at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm just having a, a lot of trouble understanding where Berkman's coming from. So he's calling the peasantry naive, but at the same time saying that they quickly saw through the ruse of, of these democratic reformers and knew that they wanted to have the means of production themselves. So I don't know if he's, he's saying that ironically or sarcastically, or if he really means that the, the, this peasantry was duped. It's, it's hard for me to tell. What are your thoughts on that? 
Oh, well, you can keep thinking about um, it. Yeah. Sure. Declaration of Independence and said they did not care for the injustice, corruption, and wage slavery which constitutionally existed in that country. The next, more liberal element, were the Social Democrats, known as the Mensheviki. Which is basically as the same as, as they the believed Social in the Democrats abolition of today. capitalism, but they declared that the revolution was not the right time oh, to Oh, actually, excuse me, Democratic Why Socialists. Not? Because it was not a proletarian the reformer revolution, movement. Claimed, even if it looked like one. They maintained that it could not be a social revolution, and therefore it should not alter the fundamental ec economic conditions of the country. According to them, it was only a bourgeois revolution, a political one, and as such, it should make only political changes. It could not be anything more than a bourgeois revolution, the Mensheviki argued, because had not the great Karl Marx taught that a proletarian revolution could take place only in a country where capitalism had reached its highest stage of development? Russia was very backward industrially, and therefore, it would be against the teachings of Marx to consider the revolution proletarian. So, so I guess now I am considering that that he is is speaking ironically when he is calling the peasantry backwards and, and naive and stuff like that. I think I think he probably did mean that facetiously, because um, it does sound like he's on the side of, of these people more so than the um, well, not these people, but the side of the 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 working class more so. Um, so these people, it sounds like they, they've bought into this, this idea that Marx had that basically communism is inevitable, but it had to go through stages. So if you have a monarchy, you can't jump straight to communism. You have to first go through capitalism, uh, which is a reform away from uh, the divine right of kings to you know, rule by capital owners. And then only at that point, when that was, was, was set up and robust, could you move on to... Uh, a communist revolution. So it sounds like that's the the idea that they have. That that. And considering how fast that that the Soviet Union did progress, and uh, eventually fall apart, th there may be some truth to that. That maybe it was a revolution that that was a bit premature. Uh, that perhaps if people had been given more time to be educated about the the uh, goals of a communist revolution, to get on the side of a communist revolution in, in spirit and, uh, you know, by their actions, maybe things would have would have taken more strongly and uh, maybe things would have worked out better. It, uh, that, that definitely is a possibility that I'm willing to entertain. Um, so maybe these these People did have a point. Um, but I think one difference that I have is I don't think that any one system is inevitable. I think systems can ebb and flow in terms of, of the freedom that they grant. Just because you have a more free system now doesn't mean that it's guaranteed not to slide back to a less free system. And it doesn't mean it's guaranteed to progress forward just because... You know, any any length of progress has happened in the past. It's no guarantee. And after reading David Graeber's recent book, which is the, called The Dawn of Everything, where he went through a lot of, of, of pre-Columbian cultures uh, in, in uh, North America and South America particularly, where there's a lot of evidence for them to have gone in many different directions at different times of their development. You know, there, there was... There was um, I think it was the Olmecs that he talked about, where they had started out in the, the normal progression that, that archaeologists think that civilization follows, where they, they went from bands and tribes up to chiefdoms and uh, then to basically a monarchy. But then at some point, they rejected that. There was a revolution and they, they went to a more egalitarian form of society where people were more or less at the same level. Everyone had a really nice house. And then they faded away. Like there, there was no guarantee that that was going to last forever. And, um, and then he, he came up with examples of the opposite where people started with more egalitarian societies and went to more um, control-based societies or authoritarian, if you like. 
So I don't think there's any inevitable form that, that any civilization takes. Um, and that's both heartening and disheartening. It's, it's heartening because you can never say that, that any one system is inevitable. And it's disheartening because any gains that you actually make are not guaranteed to stay. Just because people are, are accustomed to a way of living doesn't mean they can't be slowly eroded over time. And I, I, I would in fact say that in the US, we've certainly seen that in a lot of respects. We may have had a lot of social progress in the past 60 years, but in terms of economic progress, we've gone way back since the time of Reagan. Um, unions have all but been destroyed in this country, where at one time, getting a single union job in your family meant putting food on the table for, for the rest of your working life and, and after. Um, it was your ticket to the middle class. So there's no guarantee, is, is the point. Just because the New Deal ushered in a bunch of reforms that, that did really well for a lot of average Americans certainly didn't mean they couldn't undo all that progress. Um, so I would differ with what I, what I believe Marx's position to be on, in that regard, that somehow communism is inevitable, somehow communism will just win just because progress is always made. Amazing Wolf Skeptic, good to see you. Doing well. We're, we're uh, looking at what is communist anarchism again. Um, yeah, let's continue on in the chapter. Unless you had anything else you wanted to add about that. No, I'm fading. I gotta okay. step away. Okay, well thank you for joining me so much tonight. It's always a, a pleasure to have you on. Um, oh, this is, this is my wife Amanda. She, Hi. She joins the show whenever I can convince her to. I'm um, tired Monday through Friday. Yeah, she has a very demanding job. She she deals with um, uh, children with special behavioral needs. EBD so, kids. EBD kids. That takes a lot out of her. <laughs> so we're going to let her go and, and rest up so that she can be ready for work tomorrow. Maybe. So everyone, everyone say goodnight to Amanda. <laughs> Good night, everybody. I'm sorry. I'm touched tired. That's okay. You'll be on another show soon enough, I'm sure. Emotional behavioral disturbance. Yeah. It's kids that have a lot of uh, things like impulse control. <laughs> or a lack thereof. The impulse control problems, I should say. <laughs> that, that, that's kind of what I was aiming at. Oh, did you just knock over your water? <laughs> okay. That's okay. It didn't no, the mattress. That's okay. You just get a towel. I can't move that fast right now. Sorry, nope. guys. We had a, a little humidifier accident there. <laughs> oh, I feel bad. Um, all right. Well, let's continue on in, in the in the chapter then. Thank you. You didn't get on the mattress, so don't even worry about it. I can still worry. No, you can't. I, I say I say no. You can't tell me what to do. I can tell you what to do. Listen, just because we're in capitalism doesn't mean you have a capitalistic marriage. <laughs> All right. All right, continuing on. For that reason, capitalism must remain in Russia and be given a chance to ripen before the people could think of abolishing wage slavery. The Social Democrats had a large following among the workers of Russia, many labor unions being Menshevik. But the arguments that the... That was supposed to be Menshevik. It said mentioning, but, but close enough. Good good try there. Auto transcription. So Amazing Wolf Skeptic, you say, I, I remember when I was diagnosed with Asperger's Syndrome, I was told I would never excel in anything. In well, wow, your teachers are a bunch of dicks. Uh, and the principal told you that, that based on antisocial behavior, that you weren't going to make it past high school. Wow. Ugh. That's, that's absolutely ridiculous. That shows such a lack of empathy and understanding. Um, I'm really sorry that happened to you. But, uh, I mean, thankfully, there are, there are better people in that field, uh, like my wife, who, who don't take that approach at all. That's just terrible. Um, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, here you are. So you, you made it through somehow, despite all that. So I'm, I'm happy for you. Um, 
So you excelled in all your courses. So so it was basically just other other things that you were struggling with. And for that they, they told you that you wouldn't make it. That's that's some bullshit. That sucks. Revolution was not proletarian, only because Marx had fifty years before said that it couldn't be, did not appeal appeal to the toilers. They had made the revolution. They had fought and bled for it. They had driven out the Tsar and his clique, and they were now driving out the industrial masters, thus abolishing wave sla wage slavery and capitalism. They could not see why they could not do what they were actually doing because of someone who was long dead had believed that it couldn't be done. The reasoning of the socialist leaders was too scientific for them. Their common sense told them that it was pure nonsense and the Mensheviki lost most of their following amongst the workers. Another political party was called the Social Revolutionists. To this party belonged many of the terrorists who had been active against Tsardom in the past. And, and so a, th a thought occurs to me too, that perhaps even more than, than it being a, a matter of, of education, or understanding the, the ideas of a revolution uh, to be able for it to, for it to be able to be more permanent and, and more complete um, if it comes to be uh, perhaps it's just a matter of undoing the damage from the previous system that, that needs to take place before people can be uh, able to even interface with the idea of having more freedom and and autonomy so perhaps that was the problem with things going too fast, is that people came from being peasants, having virtually no control over their life, uh, not even being able to switch careers if they so chose, without you know probably a lot of of, of hassle, um, or or being having some particular talent that that gets noticed by some higher up. Um, Perhaps just in that sense, they, they because of the, the damage that that must do to a person to be locked into their life, as, as the current system damages people too. Capitalism is very damaged, damaging to people's psyches. You know, um, most of, of domestic disputes are because of, of issues of money. Uh, the vast majority are because of that. So that does a lot of damage to people. Clearly. Um, so I can only imagine what an even more oppressive system, such as a monarchy, that, that literally treats you as, you know, almost a different class of, of people, not, not just in terms of what you do have, but what you can have, like almost, almost a, sub, a subhuman in a way, um, you know, buys into the entire divine right of kings, nonsense, and that sort of thing. But an entire society that 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 either believes that notion or accepts it, uh, whether or not they like it, I can imagine that would do a lot of damage to people. And so, so perhaps that was more the driving force that prevented things from being more permanent or more complete. It's an interesting thing to, to contemplate, especially when we're, we're thinking about how we would ever get rid of capitalism. Yeah, I mean, if that is true, that, that it more than anything has to be the damage that is, that is undone before people are really ready for something better, then, then that more than anything else would, would point to me towards the, the strategy that, that a lot of anarchists uh, favor of building dual power. Of putting together those those systems of mutual aid to provide those basic necessities that socialists talk about now as much as possible uh, because that would go further than anything in undoing and preventing the damage caused by capitalism and the current system so i'll have to think about that more though because uh, that, that thought just occurred to me and Know, there's, there's probably more that I need to think about it to, to really flesh it out. But I just thought I'd share that. 
Let's see, Amazing Wolf Skeptic has some more ideas to share. Let's see what you have to say. So you say, uh, I didn't like to socialize with other kids. I like to just, uh, as they would put it, play with myself. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and do nothing but but read political theory and history books. So so you had your your things that you, you fixated on. Maybe that's a loaded term, but you focused on. We'll put it that way. And that's that's what you like to do. And people didn't understand that. And so said that, you know, no, no, no. You have to fit into our system where people want to have friends on these terms and, and, and want to do things in this way and have varied interests and all this stuff. And that just wasn't you. That's what it sounds like you're, you're telling me here. Uh, that's sad that they couldn't just see that you were wired different than, than average students and that there was nothing inherently wrong with that. I mean, uh, my, my oldest son has a, a nonspecific form of, of uh, autism. Uh, and he likes to watch YouTube videos and play video games and talk about YouTube videos and video games usually around Minecraft. Um, and that's what he likes to do and, and, and play with his, his siblings. But he doesn't really want to do a whole lot of other things. And he still does his, his schoolwork as well. But he just doesn't have an interest of really going anywhere or, or doing anything else. He, he has his world. And that's what he kind of uh, focuses on. And, you know, I... I I just kind of accepted that that is who he is, that, that that's that's how he's going to be. He's going to be content just doing those things probably the rest of his life. Um, and, 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 you know, hopefully he'll be able to, to get a job as well uh, when the time comes and and work that into his, his life as well. But I, I, I try my best not to, to force things on him that he really just doesn't have any interest in, in doing. Um, I mean, if, if for any other reason than because he is, uh, he does not like to be forced to do things, to say the least. Um, but I can definitely relate to, to that idea of having your things that you like and uh, only liking those things uh, and, and not being wired in, in the same way that other children are, because that, that seems to be the experience of, of my eldest son. Um, and so you also say, if you want to talk about... Oh, wait a minute. Hold on, I missed one of your messages there. Let me scroll up. It just says a lot to how neurotypical people are oblivious with other people's needs due to society that... that kind of brainwashes us into having a, a selfless approach. Sure. Sure. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Um, but definitely people should be looking to empathize with, with neuroatypical people as well. They, they're, you know, they, they can be just as much comrades as anyone else. They can be just as much valuable friends and, and members of society as, as anybody else. And there's nothing wrong with, with who they are despite what incredibly uh, damaging organizations like um, Autism Speaks will, will, will have you believe. Uh, so yeah, if, if you ever, that, that's a, a, an important side point, I would say. If you ever come across someone who wants you to donate to Autism Speaks, don't donate to them. They, they treat autism as a disease. They believe that it can be cured and they're very, they're very prejudicial to people that actually have autism. Um, so they're not a good organization. They're not doing good things for autistic people. Don't donate to Autism Speaks. Yeah, it's quite reactionary. Quite reactionary. Um, so, so you also say... If you want to talk about psychological torture and how mental illness is caused by the economy, uh, I would recommend Capitalist Realism. Oh, I read that book last year. A really great book. I, I would also very much recommend. 
Um, the author himself, uh, tr trigger warning for self-harm here, uh, the author himself kind of succumbed to his own ideas about capitalism being just this brutal, unconquerable, inevitable force that will never go away and, and ended up taking his own life tragically. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but he had, a, he had a lot of great things to say. And in fact, it, it's a pretty quick read too. Um, I think I always listen to audiobooks because that's what I got time for. I, I, I do deliveries in, in the winter time and I do landscaping in the summer. So that, that's how I consume my books. Um, and it was, it was a quick read. It, I, I finished it in an afternoon just doing my job. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend that. Mark Fisher's Capitalist Realism. Um, you say it says, a, 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 oh, I already read that one. We'll go down then. So you say, I understand completely. When I was in school, they tried to box me into a different category of people and force me to set a certain expectation like everyone else, uh, which is pretty discriminatory and kind of segregational to disabled people. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, that that's another tragic outcome of, of capitalism and, and the entire worker starve sort of mentality that this society has is that people that really, really would be opposed to uh, having to, to work in the traditional sense um, are forced to anyway, uh, just, just to live. And so if, if, you know, if all of your needs were met and all you wanted to do was, was sit around and read, uh, political theory and stuff like that, that could actually even be more beneficial to the society that you live in than you just going in and getting a, a regular sort of job. But that's not really possible under the system. Let's keep moving on. Yeah, yeah, I always love that quote. It's, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. Yep, and I always, I always counter that quote with Ursula K. Le Guin's um, capitalism, you know, I, I always butcher it too. I don't remember it exactly, but it's something to the effect of capitalism seems inevitable. It, its power seems absolute, but so do the divine right of kings. And eventually their reign all ended. Uh, well, almost all ended. I mean, I, I guess places like uh, the UK notwithstanding. Um, but yeah, not inevitable. No system is inevitable. And there definitely is hope in that. Uh, but the, you know, that also means that the, 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 the price of, of any sort of progress has to be constant vigilance. You constantly have to work to, to maintain the gains that you've, you've already gotten. Uh, otherwise, it could easily sli slide back. People could get duped by things like Reaganomics and decide that uh, it's actually, you know, greed is actually good after all. And all these other systems that have, or all these other ideas that have led us to our current state where the wealth gap is ever widening. People are feeling ever more hopeless and, and rightly so. And wealth is just concentrating in fewer and fewer hands and in older and older hands as well. I often like to bring up that uh, uh, the millennial generation controls a tiny fraction of the wealth that the boomers did at our same age. So I'm on the older end of the millennials. I'm, I'm 39. And uh, at, at, at 39, the boomers owned something like 20% of the world's wealth. And today, millennials own like, I think it's like one and a half percent. And it, it, it's not as though uh, Gen X is even that much better. They're only at, I don't think they're even in double digits in terms of the amount of wealth they own. Um, and if it wasn't for Mark Zuckerberg, millennials would own even less. <laughs> uh, so, so there's that as well. The, the, by, by any reasonable metric, uh, oops, I tapped something there. By any reasonable metric, millennials are doing worse than their parents did. Um, and that's 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 a feature, not a bug. That's 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 capitalism 
concentrating wealth as it's supposed to into the hands of the deserving few, right? Yeah, so there was authors back in the medieval era who wrote that they thought feudalism was always going to be a thing. Absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm sure. I mean, think about even the Roman Empire. Roman Empire lasted, like the, the, the Roman Empire proper even. Let's not even consider the, the Holy Roman Empire and, and all the other ones. But just the, the, the regular Roman Empire lasted a thousand years. A thousand years. Imagine being someone born in like the year, well, I guess there was no year zero, the year one, we'll say, one AD. And, and, and if you could know that, that, you know, your, the, the, the ruler that was the, the, you know, the biggest kid on the block in your day had been there 500 years and would be there 500 more. That just seems like forever. And in terms of a human lifetime, it really is. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So so even even excluding the Byzantine Empire, and and the Eastern Roman Empire, and the Holy Roman Empire, and all that stuff, uh, Roman Empire lasted a thousand years just on its own, um, before it split apart into the the various other incarnations of the Roman Empire. And and there's there's definitely people that would argue that the the Roman Empire never really ended at all. It just changed who was in charge of it. You know, eventually went to to Britain. And they they conquered half the world, and and then it went to the U.S. and now we've built our empire, and so on and so forth, and and so much of our mythology, so much of our ways of conceiving of of law comes directly from the Romans. So in 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 many ways, in many big ways, the Roman Empire never did end, up until this point. But yeah, that 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 would just seem immeasurably huge and powerful. But it did come to an end, at least the the traditional Roman Empire did come to an end. As every empire will come to an end. Eventually, Britain lost control of, you know, most of its its former colonies. Um, and the U.S. will too. That, that part is inevitable. No empire lasts forever. Um, but we always have to be pushing things to move in a direction that, that is more just and, and fair for everybody because it's not just going to slide in our direction on its own. So in many ways, the world we live in, we still live under the philosophies of the Roman Empire. Yeah, absolutely true. I mean, you look at things like fascism, which, which took so much of its, its uh, perception of itself uh, directly from Rome, especially when, when it first cropped up in, in Italy, which was, you know, the historic place of, of where Rome was. Um, the Roman Empire, that I should say, the heart of it. Um, the Roman salute, uh, a lot of the iconography, a lot of the, the ideals, all came from, from Rome, that's true. Yep. Ideas of the death penalty, punitive justice, inspired by the Roman Empire. Yeah, for sure. There are definitely three lines. But still, nothing is inevitable forever. Everything eventually will crumble. Um, but let's let's get back to the book. We're almost done with this chapter, and that's going to be all we're going to do tonight. We're going to finish up chapter 15, and then we'll call it a night. The social revolutionists had numerous adherents, mainly among the farming population but they alienated them by taking a stand for the continuation of war when the country was against it. This attitude also caused a split in the party, the conservative element being known as the right socialist revolutionists, while the more revolutionary faction called itself the left socialists revolutionists. The latter, led by Maria Spiridonova, who had suffered many years of Siberian imprisonment under the Tsar, advocated the termination of war and secured a very considerable following, particularly among the poorer agricultural classes. The most radical element in Russia were the anarchists, who demanded immediate peace, free <laughs> land for the peasants, and the socialization <laughs> of the means of production and distribution. They wanted the abolition of capitalism and wage slavery, equal rights for all and privileges for none. The land the factories and mills, the machinery of production, and the, machine, the means of distribution were to become the possession of the whole people. Each able person 
was to work according to his ability and to receive according to his needs. There was to be full liberty for everyone and joint use on the basis of mutual inter interests. The anarchists warned the proletariat against de delegating power to any government or placing a political party in authority. Government of any kind, they said, would stifle the revolution and rob the workers of the results already achieved. The life and welfare of a country depended on economics, not politics, they argued. That is, what the people want is to live, to work, and to satisfy their needs. And, and, and again, here's, here's one, another spot where I kind of disagree with Berkman, not, not in spirit. Um, I, I can definitely get behind the idea of, of wanting to, to just do away with, with governance altogether. Uh, but to have any sort of permanent change or, or you know, permanent, whatever that means, long lasting change anyway, it, it, it does kind of seem to me that you need some sort of organized apparatus. Kropotkin was, was a real big fan of the idea that these sort of organizations would just spontaneously arise to, uh, you know, defend the city against invaders, to distribute resources equitably, to just do mutual aid amongst once another, one, one another. And I think potentially there, there is a case to be made for that, but I think people have to have had a, a long experience with, with living in that way ahead of time. Which again is why I keep coming back to the idea of, of this prefiguration where we set up dual power structures ahead of time. We use the rotting corpse of capitalism to, to shield us against um, any sort of, you know, would-be usurper. But in the meantime, we're building that practice where mutual aid becomes just second nature. So of course you help out your neighbor. Of course you don't think of anything in return. Of course, everyone is deserving of the basics of life. Of course, everyone deserves an equal say in, in the labor that they choose to perform. Uh, so I think that, again, you know, if, if, if there had been a tradition of that ahead of time, where enough people were, were, were familiar with that sort of operation, then sure, maybe things could just keep happening the way they had been only without the the oversight of a you know top-down government body perhaps then even still uh i don't know i just worry that that it leaves things very open or very vulnerable to then attack uh because you know we, we may not like capitalism at all but there aren't armies coming in to to conquer us every day uh, there's not the threat that that entire cities will just succumb to, uh, you know, some sort of criminal cartel, um, strong arming everybody, and, you know, ruling through fear and, and intimidation and coercion directly. Um, so we have to be able to survive beyond that point too. It's like let's use capitalism as as kind of the scaffolding that we can build these, these power structures on amongst one another so that when that scaffolding crumbles, the system still stands, right? It doesn't just crumble along with it. Uh, it, it it's not vulnerable to the first, you know, gusty day that comes along to, to come and blow it all over. Um, so I can see that, that perspective as long as you have that, that mass tradition of, of, thinking and behaving in that way and caring about these values of, of you know, freedom, democracy, choice, uh, equity, um, agency, all, the, all these sorts of things, democracy. Uh, and as, as long as you have a tradition of, of solving problems in that manner, you know, working as a, a de facto governing body, even if it's on just a local level. I think that stands a much better chance of, of surviving any sort of threat that comes to it from without or from within. And, and unfortunately, it seems as though most of the Russian people did not have that, that, that tradition, that long-standing tradition of, of knowing how to even behave under a new regime. Because, I mean, the, the, this wasn't even 
the communist revolution at this point. This was this was more akin to a bourgeois democracy, like they were saying, m m much closer to how things were in the the United States uh, when when they had their revolution. So, yeah, yeah, always interesting to wonder what if. Um, but I think the lesson really is that, yeah, you can't just rely, at least as, as far as I'm concerned, I, I would say you can't just rely on an elite few to topple the current order and just give power back to everybody. Sometimes I think it can happen. I think that, that as far as I understand it, that more or less is what happened with uh, Rojava, the, you know, the... the, the um, Oh, what is their official political organization name? I don't remember. But uh, uh, it's it's the Syrian Kurds who, you know, more or less gained an autonomous zone and in the beginning uh, behaved very much like a, a you know authoritarian left sort of uh, movement. But then their 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 leader had a, a change of heart after being imprisoned and reading Murray Bookchin. And absorbing all of his ideas and through him disseminated these ideas to the the various leaders and they in fact did give power back to the people so i think that that the model is possible too but but again look at that they had their tradition of of a leftist political movement people more or less as far as i understand it and i'm definitely no expert on rojava and how that went down but it seems to me that they at least had some tradition of, of revolutionary ideas and revolutionary action uh, from a leftist perspective. So that when power did filter back down to them, they were ready to, to run with it. And it's pretty, it seems like it's pretty incredible what they've, what they've done. And of course, no system is perfect, but that should never be, uh, that should never be our benchmark is, is absolute perfection. It's, but it does seem like they've done a lot better than a lot of leftist revolutions have in terms of actually implementing the the systems of power distribution that they talked about from the beginning we'll definitely have to take a lot more of a closer look at them um which person am i talking about oh let me find out i'll, I'll find you the name right now we do only have a few minutes left so i do want to 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 finish up the the chapter but uh uh but I'll find that name for you. Let's see. And I'll link, I'll just, here, Wikipedia is good enough for a, a, a cursory look at, at what went down. So here's the Rojava revolution. I'll paste it for y'all so you can see it for yourselves. Um, let's see who their leader was. Let's see if I can find it. Still looking. Let me, I'm gonna have to search better here. So I quit bumping it. Why can't I find the leader's name? I hate that when I, I can't find the information I'm looking for. It starts with an O. That's, that's all I can remember at this point. Let's see if I search with the word book chin.
Abdullah Akalon. Yeah, Akalon, that was the name. So he read the Murray Bookchin's theories while in prison. So yeah, here's another cool article to check out from him, from Murray Bookchin's daughter. How her father <laughs> inspired a, a revolution. That's a cool one. Check it out. You know, once in a while we get some some trolls in, but they they don't tend to stay very long. I just you know I bat them, I bat them pretty quickly. I guess they've gotten the idea, or I've just banned. <laughs> Most of the ones that, that tend to troll leftists. So that you say, this is why I'm skeptical of Leninists, because it's the vanguard which believes the workers can't organically do a revolution, so they should be a prof they should be professionals to do the job for them. Or there should be professionals to do the job for them. They didn't have a lot of faith in the working person's potential. I think it was also just that you know, they didn't think they had enough time to, to get everybody on their side. They, they, they saw an opportunity and they, they, they seized it, right? Like, uh, um, Lenin was writing State and Revolution. He was, he was getting to the end of it as the October Revolution happened and he had to go off to, to fight in the revolution. So I think that more than anything was, was the case with uh, the, the Bolsheviks and their revolution, that um, they just saw their, their moment and they, they tried to seize it as best they could. And perhaps they did uh, just remake a lot of the, the old forms of power, uh, the old power concentrations, just in, in, a, in a new configuration. But I think in many ways uh, the Soviet Union was pretty objectively better than bourgeois democracies. But I mean, they, and, and also they had pressure from the very beginning. The, the West, the so-called West, uh, Western democracies hate leftist revolutions. And from, from the time that they won power finally, they, they defeated the white army finally. Uh, the Western powers were on top of them trying to topple their new leaders. So there's there's always more to it. There's always more things complicating history. It's it's never just cut and dry, the, the set of circumstances that leads to any one thing. Um, but yeah, I, I do, I am skeptical of a, a vanguardist approach. I, I prefer very much the, the prefigurative uh, building of dual power as an approach because I think it 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 gets people in the habit of living as they would after a, a the current power structure is overthrown uh, or or starved of its power however it it comes about or it just collapses of its own way however it comes down it gives people a a history of or a, a practice of living as they would, as, as if there was no overarching capitalist system in the first place. It comes as close as we can get to living under a, a system of, you know, anarcho capital or anarcho, anarcho communism. Almost, almost had a, a slip there. Jeez. Um, and and then that gives a lot more buy-in if there ever is an opportunity to really create some sort of, you know, say autonomous zone at the very least. Um, people already know what to expect. People already have been living that way more or less. Uh, and right now there's a lot of opportunity in, in building these parallel structures because local governments certainly aren't providing the basic necessities for people's lives. You know, they're not providing housing very much. Um, they're not really providing transportation. They provide some education, but only through high school. Uh, after that point, you're on your own. Um, so there's opportunities there as well. Um, and there's opportunities to fill in gaps that come from our current 
funding system for for you know k through 12 education which is completely dependent on on local property taxes specifically so i mean that this is originally a lot of racist intent behind this so that you know the good white neighborhoods didn't have to support their poor black neighbors and of course they would divide they would carve up the the school district lines to uh insulate themselves from the the you know, bad contagion of, of the non-white people that they were living by. Uh, so, I mean, it continues today, though, to, to have that same effect, whether or not that's, that's literally written into the law. That, that definitely is the effect, is that people that are in poor places, which tend to be people of color, have worse schools because they're already poor, so that means they have less property taxes, the property is less valuable, uh, and those property taxes, there's less of them to go around. So you end up having woefully underfunded schools compounding with that. Um, all the other sort of damage that comes with, with capitalism, the constant living on the edge of, of making it, um, all the, the, the mental and emotional trauma that comes with that, um, the damage it does to, to family stability. You know, especially if you have to, to move a lot because you you know you may get evicted. Um, yeah, all all of these these problems feed in on each other um, to make for a really poor system. But in that poor delivery of of education, there is opportunity for groups to come in and just amongst themselves fill in those gaps help with after school programs, you know, help tutor ch children, um, help train them to do things like be mechanics or, or be plumbers or do other trades. Or if they want to go to school, uh, 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 like tertiary school, uh, uh, whether that's just college or, or grad school or a doctorate program after that, you know, pool your resources, help them get prepared for that as well. Uh, and the more we do this, the, the more actual liberation that takes place, the less effects of capitalism are going to be felt by, by the poorest of people. And at the same time, like I said, they're getting that, that, that tradition of, you know, well, let's just call it radical existence, uh, down. They, they'll understand things like, how to run a local meeting, how to participate in, in direct democracy. Um, they won't just stand for things like, uh, you know, unfair treatment. They'll learn how to organize and, and demand things like better mass transit so that they can all have better access to jobs and opportunities and just other places, you know, the, the basic things that, that most people get who, who have any halfway decent job anyway that so that's why i i favor that strategy over a, a vanguard system where you just have elite an elite group that comes in sets things up and then devolves power to the people in the communist version it, it usually comes in the in the form of a dictatorship of the proletariat where they set up a worker state and as workers all come together and figure out what that state's going to look like and how it's going to protect the rights of average people over the rights of, of capital, the, the former capital owners, because there would be no capital owners uh, anymore. People would all own it together. Anyway, let's, let's finish off this chapter here. Oh, shoot, I've gone over time. This Sensible Got rambling again. Industry Dang it. Necessary. I'm just going to have to, to ride this out to politics, the end of the chapter. Insisted, it's a game to rule and govern men, not to help them live. In short, the anarchists advise, advise the toilers to permit no one to become their master again, to abolish political government, and to manage their agrarian, industrial, and social affairs for the good of all instead of for the benefit of so, so, so just to catch you back up to speed because I, that was a that was a long sidebar that i took there 
Uh, so this is what he's saying the anarchists are advocating for in the midst of this, this first wave of revolution in Russia. Rulers and exploiters. They called upon the masses to stand by their Soviets and to look after their interests by means of their own organization. Well, I'm even mistaken on that. Is this the communists the who are saying? The anarchists were, however, comparatively oh, okay. small in numbers. Oh, no, no. As this the is the anarchists, yes. the most advanced and revolutionary element, they had been persecuted by the czarist regime even worse than the socialists. Many of them had been executed, others imprisoned, and their organization suppressed as illegal. It was most dangerous to belong to the anarchists, and their work of education was exceedingly difficult. Therefore, the anarchists were not strong and could not exert much influence upon the people at large in a vast country of 120 millions of population. But they had a great advantage in that their idea appealed to the healthy instincts and sound sense of the masses. To the extent of their ability and limited power, the anarchists encouraged the demand for peace land and bread and actively help care well thanks for for sticking around there radical maniac i'm glad you dropped by too and i hope to see you in future streams as well um yeah have a good night to you as well carry out those demands by direct expropriation and the formulation of a free communal life there was another political party in russia which is far more numerous and better organized than the anarchists. The party that realized the value of the anarchist ideas and set out to work to carry them out. It was the Bolsheviki. There we go. Ooh, a little, this has been a production a little cliffhanger anarchist. for the next you can chapter. Find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube. What a great service, Audible Anarchist. I, I really love it. Putting all these, these public domain books out there for free in audio form. This on and that sets up next week. So next week we're going to talk about the Bolsheviki, who had a, a different theory for how to go ahead with, with revolution than the anarchists did. Uh, all right. So that's going to do it for tonight. I really got to wrap things up quickly. Uh, if you like this sort of thing, don't forget to follow. If you're on, if you're watching on Twitch or like or subscribe, wherever it is that you're coming from, I always have my my archives of these episodes. I have them all separated neatly into playlists on YouTube. So go check that out as well. That's all in my link tree, uh, which I will put up presently. So there you go. Just go ahead and follow that link tree right there, and it'll take you to all the different platforms that I am on. And, uh, yeah, I, and also consider donating, too. I, I would really like to, at some point, make this at least my part-time gig. And to do so, I need, I need support from viewers like you. Um, so, yeah, if you, if you find this valuable, um, I also do video game streams. I've been going through The, the Witcher 3 lately, trying to... to navigate a medieval society and is a close to a leftist way as possible through all the different choices that that Geralt has to make through the the course of the game um on Sundays I kind of do whatever I feel like uh lately it's been things like permaculture um and and stuff on new urbanism and it could just be really anything we did we did a a podcast that that explored the origins of whiteness Recently, that was, that was a pretty big hit. Um, so we looked at that podcast. That was really cool. Uh, but it can be really anything. So if you like these sorts of, of topics, then yeah, don't forget to, to hit that, that follow or like or subscribe or whatever it is, wherever you're coming from. All right. I do appreciate that too, Radical Maniac. Thanks for you for sticking with the raid. Let's see who's on right now. And we will start the raid as soon as possible. Who deserves our raid today? Let's see. It looks like non-compete just started, so I don't think I will raid him and also have raided him recently. Um, 
having trouble deciding. Never done book smart, so that's a possibility. Maybe the humanist report, maybe poly people or proudly radical. Any thoughts from, from the viewers? Looks like not. I guess I'm just gonna have to pick somebody. We'll do Proudly Radical. It's been a while since I've rated Proudly Radical, so we'll do them. Oh. Sorry, there was a commercial running. Got to mute that a second. So, wherever you're coming at this from, if you want some another cool person to follow, follow Proudly Radical on Twitch. There's the link for that. And otherwise, we'll start the raid as soon as we possibly can. Thank you all for joining me. I really appreciate you all sticking around. Thank you, uh, Alyosha, very much for the, the raid earlier on. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna pay it forward to proudly radical. <laughs>